as a consultant really, to give me access to, to their areas of, um, of inquiry. So the different research groups, cancer research, they're looking at um, genetics and biomarkers of individualised cancer treatment, biomechanic group, a mental health group and infection controls, so I mean really disparate groups, really medical research. Um, and you know, the, there's that, that anxiety at the beginning of the project, you know, how the hell am I going to connect these different things or find something meaningful um, that, that makes sense to these very disparate groups. You know, what's the appropriate level of understanding as an artist? Um, what, is, what is the intention of the finished artworks? Is it to illustrate the science? Is it to create some kind of, um, point, of point of interest? You don't want it to be superficial, but you know, there's, there's a limit to um, the level of understanding. And also a recognition that you know, art isn't about explanation. Art isn't about illustrating or describing. Um, so the approach that I took was to try and find the connections between. And, and all that the group shared was a, a zooming in and out of the problem. So they would be looking at a molecular um, uh, activity and then they would be zooming out and looking at the whole person in the clinical setting. There was a relationship between the research laboratory and the clinical, the whole person and the fragmented part. So all the artworks that were produced made some sense of that, of, of the whole being greater than the sum of its parts and are partial and complete at the same time looking at the whole person and the fragmented person or body. So one piece uh, was, so these are derived from 3D scans. Um, the whole body is encapsulated in sheets of metal, so it's, as it's if you're familiar with CT scans, there's slices through the, the body. Um, so it's reminiscent of that. As you move past it, your position changes and you see different parts of the body and you get, uh, so from a single point perspective, you get a very limited view, but as you get 360 degrees, you get the whole. So seeing and not seeing. Um, a similar approach to these, these are 3D portraits. Um, I hope they don't fit the techno kitsch category that was described earlier. Um, but it's using a 3D scanner and um, you know, Rhino, Programming. I worked with a, with a 3D designer to help me when my technological skills um, reached a, a, an end. Um, and it, so these are, these are portraits rendered in wire mesh 3D modelling um, graphic that also has an organic quality. So it's the, com the, the combination between the biological and organic and, and the technological and the modelled. Um, and a third piece uh, brought them together. Um, very much you know, one another thing they shared was about community um, and the different communities between the research laboratories, the clinical settings, the relationship with patients um, who were participating in the surveys. So, you know, these are abstract representations of the body um, in, in rendered in different ways, but they're, they're there to, to locate the, the building. These aren't a, a critique of the science, this is a public art commission and within that context I just want to kind of highlight the, these different functions within different art contexts. So, you know, this is not a collaboration, this is not public engagement, um, but the visual communication to help create a, a sense of visual identity for that place and for the population and community that, that work and learn in it. Second example is a commission but within a museum setting. So the intention here was to make visible the invisible. The um, Museum of the History of Science, one of the Oxford University museums, um, has an amazing collection, about 10,000 uh, microscope slides from Edwardian and Victorian times, the times when you had lots of domestic scientists or you know, collectors um, that would, would collect in their living rooms and have their microscopes um, outside of the institution. So you had all these avid, avid collectors and this vast collection, but the collection cannot be seen, the contents of the collection cannot be seen with the human eye. So I was um, commissioned as a, a visual artist alongside a performance poet and writer, Will Holloway, and the two of us worked together and with the archivists and the curators of the museum 
um, to create an installation. So the intention here was to, to take this collection for us to respond creatively to it, to seek advice from the expertise within the museum, and to make works that would share um, some of that collection with the public in accessible ways. Um, and the, the relationship between myself and Will was really interesting. We were working in different art forms, but it, there was an iterative, more kind of baton passing uh, process where we discuss ideas, and one idea from him would feed a visual which I'd then make and then feed back to him, which would then generate more words, which would feed back to me, etc. And from that grew um, stop frame animations with, with audio, interior design pieces, um, textiles, wallpapers. Um, and then curated examples from the archive, so we selected and, and framed and staged certain parts that we thought had particular significance. Um, and again, so the conversations with the, the scientists, it was from the kind of curators and archivists um, who had the scientific uh, background, it was really important and it was collaborative, but we, we were the creators, there was no <coughs> co-creation um, question, but they, they, without them, um, our understanding of what we were looking at and what we were working with would have been far more superficial, so they were a really key part of that conversation. And it was the, the conversations that fed into the, the end product. So we were trying to tell stories, trying to tell stories from this um, a dead collection, a collection of dead things <coughs> in small slides in the in dusty archive, um, and try to bring it to life. Um, and tell stories to the public and, and engage them in, in different ways. So these kind of commissions are very much a creative puzzle for me. Um, you have the thing, you have the problem, or you have the setting. And I see it as my job to, to observe and to take notes and to notice things and to make novel connections between them and, and then find ways of, of engaging others in those observations. Or, um, and, and I you know, greatly enjoy it when that's in this cross-discipline because then those, those processes become more expanded. Example number three. Um, I live in London. I have done for 20 years. I love London. It's messy, it's dirty, it's culturally rich, it's just got all this going on. It's also really interesting for art science at the moment, as it's, it's happening. Um, I've mostly, prior to this project, um, had worked within medical science and biomedical issues. I also lived on a, at the time lived on a second floor flat with a, a second floor apartment with a window box, um, and that was my only green fingered activity. It was, was growing a bit of mint uh, to fit into my salads. And I saw advertised a residency in a botanical garden in Wales, um, and thought, well, I, don't, I don't want to pigeonhole my, hold myself into this sort of biomedical artist. Um, I wonder what I could do in the countryside for six months. That would be really interesting to go and find out. So I applied out of curiosity. I think they shortlisted me out of curiosity. At the interview, there were five of us. There were four botanical illustrators and me coming along with sort of skin organism pictures and um, various microbiology things. Um, and to, the, to their credit and my gratitude, they, they selected me as the, as the curious outlier to see what I could do. And I really didn't know what I was going to do in the country for that time. You know, really, as an artist, how many artists have you got in the room, by the way? I was going to do this at the beginning, actually, poll everybody. Can we see artists? Can we see scientists? Hands up. Anyone who thinks they're a bit of both? Anyone who thinks they're neither? <laughs> okay, actually, that's a kind of reasonable space. Um, these kind of events tend to be dominated more by the arts than scientists, but we have a healthy, a healthy number of scientists here. Um, so, those that um, are artists and used to kind of not knowing what they're doing um, will understand this. But it's, it, you know, you develop processes for finding out what it is you want to do. You, you, you start with an approach. Um, of, I'm going to ask questions about this, this is an area of exploration. So it's not a hypothesis-driven exploration, it's a general inquiry of I'm interested in exploring um, this, this area and I'll use these tools to do that. And it always leads somewhere interesting. Um, I'm predominantly from a photographic arts background, so I started taking photographs and they all looked a bit kind of pretty. 
and I was very satisfied with them. And day in, I was going into the studio and I was noticing these little micro changes in all these, you know, the National Botanic Garden in Wales is vast, it's got a great history of, you know, kind of designed landscape and natural landscape. It has a science centre looking at um, kind of genetics within bot botanical um, specimens and um, rare endangered species of brambles and dandelions that have you know, had a terrible um, catastrophic effect on the um, biosphere if they disappear. So it's, it's a really interesting place and, and things are changing and growing and dying the whole time. And having the opportunity as a residency, as opposed to a commission, and I want to draw that distinction, um, is that you have much more freedom to roam and to explore and to allow things to, to happen and evolve. Um, so I started growing things and the, the outcome from the residency were two main pieces. There, there were some, um, some photographic works, but most of the work that was produced now only exists as photographic documentation. They were, they were living, temporary installations or outstallation, as this one may be. Um, and this, this is called the Armchair Botanist, so it's a comment on our domestication of nature and how we like to kind of harness it and bring it into our living rooms and, and cover our, our interior decor with, with botanical patterns. Also, it sits situated at the top of a, a landscaped garden, so it's that idea of, of controlling um, natural form. So you can sit um, in the armchair and the TV is now overgrown with ivy as is the chair and everything around it, and you can sit and look at the, the landscape in front of you and ponder. Um, another piece was uh, Living Room, which drew on some of the scientific um, work that was being done. I mentioned that the rare endemic uh, Welsh species of brambles and dandelions, things that I would think of as weeds and try and dig up from the garden. Um, but they're trying to protect and, and work out why they're disappearing from the habitat. So this installation is, is packed full of the species that um, were being uh, studied and with an attempt to protect them. And it is irrigated so that the walls weep and the seeds at the beginning of the installation um, germinate and grow um, until it died after seven weeks and that's the end of it. So for this work, it was you know, about, about taking risks. It was a really important pivotal moment for me as an artist to be, okay, what if I try something completely different, um, very much out of my comfort zone, working with stuff that I'm, you know, I don't know. I'm working with biological material, um, the, you know, very much um, not comfortable with what it was going to be. I can't control what's happening. Um, I don't know how long it's going to live, I don't know if it's going to water easily, I don't know which way it's going to grow. Um, there is no, no control of the final image that I can make. I can set up the conditions for it to happen, um, but then it's, it's a case of watching the actually do its thing in the situation that I've contrived. Um, and layers of interpretation. It doesn't matter that somebody coming to this doesn't know that the bramble in there is, is rare and might, might go and that's a dozen scientists in another room are, are, are studying it. But you know, I think good art operates as an immediate visceral reaction and then layers of interpretation, and they will be different and unique to each person looking at it. Um, and that's where it gets tricky when it comes to artists working with science, which is very much about describing and defining and pinning down and explaining how things work. And quite often that's at odds with artists who want to just place something that they've found interesting and, and have you know, created in a way that gets attention and, and hopefully seeks a bit of interest and inquiry. But you know, I'm not interested in defining and pinning it down. I, I want people to go, oh, that looks interesting, what's that? I want to find out more about it. It's about setting the questions. And so you know, that's one of, the, one, of the, one of the many kind of conflicts. Um, but that, that, can be, that can be rich. Um, all three of these projects have been funded by the host organisations, so they, you know, there is an agenda um, to, to draw from, from that situation. Um, the invitation is to, to observe and create a response to being in that environment. 
Um, and the, you know, the interactions, I did work narratively with botanists and with horticulturalists in these settings. Um, so you start with ideas and lines of inquiry, but no predefined outcomes. So what happens if you, you know you're going to have an exhibition at the end of that time? So you're working towards something, but what that will look like, you're not, you've not been asked to define at the outset, which is, you know, which is great um, to not have to, to, to limit, but can be quite terrifying to have a completely open field. Fourth example is a research residency. So I was um, a research fellow, and this was funded by Arts Council England and the Arts and Humanities Research Council. So that's an academic and an arts funding body working together. They, there was a series um, about 10 years ago of, of these residencies where academic institutions put joint proposals together with an artist um, to have an artist work with them embedded in, in their laboratories or their, their research area. So it's a joint proposal coming from the institution that um, engaging an artist. And it was over a period of a year. So um, I had, had a year to get my head around four different uh, research groups within the School of Life Sciences, um, which again were very disparate, um, from evolutionary biology, um, just Drosophila genetics, so the fruit fly is you know, one of the main sort of genetic model organisms in the lab. Um, sepia, cuttlefish camouflage, there's an animal behaviourist group working with, with cuttlefish, and um, nano uh, scientists working with nanofibres and protein design, building proteins from nano sized peptides. And I call this the discomfort zone, and this I think is the, the best example of that. I'd be in seminars at lunchtime and I would understand maybe 1% of what was being said. Because they're talking at you know, such a specific level within that community. And it's a really interesting process to get it to be completely out of your depth. Um, and the, so you go from feeling completely intimidated and feeling utterly stupid um, and then thinking, but no, 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 I'm not meant to get it. I haven't, you know, they've done 12 years training before they can understand this language. So it's fine, it's fine. So you reassure yourself. And then, well, okay, well, what can I get from this observation? Um, and the, it's, it's the discussion, so what I, as a way to get my head into you know, quite difficult science without that background. You know, I don't have tra any training in science. science. I've, I've always been interested in how things work and the lay interest, but no training. Um, so I, I asked people to draw things for me and that became quite a significant part of the process a drawn dialogue, so two people communicating what they understand, what they don't understand through um, a piece of paper. And that formed quite a, a large part of the final exhibition. And the exhibition was really a collection of artefacts from the process of the conversations that I had. And I felt very much like a bee pollinating from one group to another. They, the research groups were part of the same faculty, but they didn't necessarily talk to each other. Not out of any antisocial thing, they're just busy talking to other people who understood their very specialist um, area. Um, and so there's an element of, of being a, a nexus or a communicator of taking little bits that I'd heard somewhere else and as I went around and, and spoke with the different research groups. And there are 10 scientists involved. And you know, through those conversations, a lot of stereotypes and assumptions came up. Um, two admitted that they only got involved in the project because they wanted to see what a real artist was like. They had ideas of um, Tracy Emin. I, had, I spent a two hour conversation defending Tracy Emin as, as important to art history, um, which I would never have been asked to do in any, in any other context. Um, so this, you know, it's a, it works both ways. Um, I'm going in and asking what may seem stupid questions, but why do you do things like that? And they say, oh, I don't know, we've always done it that way. Um, but maybe we'll start to think about doing it another way. And equally, I'm being asked to, to present a position of contemporary art. And slowly, those conversations, as long as you are kind of open to, to hearing what the other person is saying, then you can lead to a greater understanding. Um, I mean, I could spend a long time talking about the, the assumptions and the stereotypes that I've tried to disband over the years. Maybe they can come up again in the panel discussion.
the individual and collective argument was also one that was mentioned. So I might have some things to say about that too. Um, so the, the end exhibition ends up being sort of napkin drawings, the science, scientists trying to explain um, their work through, through drawing. Um, a co-created uh, Drosophila enthusiasts manual. Um, I don't know if Haynes manuals are just UK based, but if, if car owners of the 70s and 80s would get a, car, a manual that would show the sort of complete diagrammatic deconstruction of their car so they could replace any bit, they're called Haynes car manuals. And they had a particular graphic style. And through a conversation between myself and the Drosophila geneticist, that became an ongoing conversation about um, design within biological, within the organism of, of the fruit fly. We co-created a, a, a sort of enthusiast manual. So if you're going to do DIY genetic fruit fly experiments at home, this would enable you to do it. Um, the conversation thing it expanded. Um, I was really interested in how they dealt with representation, and it's been touched on a little bit earlier on. Um, as someone's mentioned, the, the more beautiful something gets, the less information it carries. Um, well, you know, and that's something that scientists deal with a lot. They want to, to communicate, um, and, and visual <coughs> things are ways to do that, but it's often quite difficult for them to do that in a way that justifies their um, motivations. So I invited members of the diff four different research groups together around a table with some pens and a tablecloth, and, um, and they had a conversation about the trouble that they found with visual representation. And the conversation unfolded, um, and so one person would explain through drawing, this is, this is how I have to use visuals to explain what I do, and somebody else would come along, this is how I do it, and they would um, talk about the frustrations and the possibilities, and, um, and hopefully throughout the conversation as it unfolded, find synergies between ways that they were able to, to communicate. I won't let it go, it goes on for a few minutes. But, you know, as the conversation progressed, the tablecloth became more messy, they became more emphatic, and, and, and I wouldn't say that it resulted in the work of art, but it did result in um, an interesting visual artefact from a fascinating conversation. And then it's, that was presented in the exhibition, so people, an edited version, people would come and sit at the table and and listen to fragments of that conversation to try and I wanted to share I'd taken so much from the conversations that I'd had from the questions that I posed to the scientists about creativity and experimentation how they how they approach that um, how they approach visual communication and so the, through sound installation and the projection piece um, visitors were able to come and, and engage with the, with the fragmented and a multi-layered version of that, a curated conversation. So this, what came out of it as product is, is not important at all to me as an artist. Um, I don't think any great artwork came out of that year that I spent there. Um, but a lot of artifacts, a lot of questions, a lot of understanding about process, about approaches, about intention um, came out of it and have, have been really important for subsequent work, of the, the challenges and the assumptions and the realisations. I want to shift modes a little bit, because that, that dialogical approach um, I've taken into my teaching for 16 years, I taught photographic arts. Um, I've done lots of community arts education, taught in university, and um, there was also my practice around on one side and my teaching didn't seem to, to connect. Four years ago, um, myself and some colleagues set up a, a learning programme at the University of Westminster in London as a way to try and bring some of the experiences I was um, having as a practitioner, working in different settings, exploring new territory, talking to people whose languages I, I struggle to understand, or that we were talking across purposes a lot of the time, um, and the rich territory that that was giving me as an artist, I wanted to take that to stu my students. So we recruited 
students from six different discipline areas, and those selectors, we, we chose microscopy as a starting point, as a, as a central um, focus for the inquiry. So these, was, these disciplines were selected as having some interest in vision, perception, mediated vision imaging technologies. Um, and this is how, how it looked. Um, we'd encourage them to collaborate in an interdisciplinary way, um, and then generate self-set projects. There's no prescribed curriculum at all. Uh, we started with a theme, and then the academic staff who also came from those disciplines um, would, would also add stimulus and would give the students lots to work with, and then it would self-organise, what we call an emerging curriculum. Um, and so within this framework, students are the experts and the novices. So a student from imaging science uh, will be able to explain with authority their, their growing expertise. And this is at undergraduate level, about midway through their course, so second year undergraduate. Um, and equally, they're walking into new territories, um, not knowing a thing and being completely out of their depth, and shifting those positions between experts and novice. Um, this doesn't just go for the students, the staff are also in the same position. Um, so it's a, very much a lowering of hierarchies. Um, everybody is a learner, everybody is a teacher, everybody is a researcher. Um, and one of the main motivations for this was the idea that students in a monodisciplinary environment wouldn't necessarily recognise their expertise. They, they would compare themselves to other people within the same kind of skill set and knowledge base. Um, but by stepping outside of that and realising that what they know is actually pertinent to their specialism and to, to themselves and that they have something to share, we thought would we, we hoped would increase confidence and increase recognition in, in that virtue and expertise. And, and through this, earlier I think it was in Roger Molina's talk, a, he put a distinction between multi-inter and transdisciplinary um, inquiry. And the Broad Vision Project, multi, you have different disciplines coming together. Um, they could, they don't necessarily need to kind of shift the territory, but there's a pooling of, of skills. Um, interdisciplinary tends to be when there's a, there's a bit more of kind of crossing boundaries, or you're actually sort of looking at things, looking at the same problem, but bringing different elements together. And, Within the broad vision context, the most successful collaborations between students is where something transformational happened in that collaboration. That their, their existing skill sets, their existing uh, research methodologies or approaches to, to you know, asking questions or you know, finding solutions to problems um, would somehow be transformed by engaging with somebody who had a very different starting point. And that they would then be able to take that expanded field back to their own discipline. Um, I'm very much against this kind of idea of melting pot and this, this, this happy third culture thing. Um, it's, you know, I think to, to be interdisciplinary you need to have a discipline. Um, and I think the most productive things that can happen from crossing disciplinary divides is when you are, you are taking that, that experience back to your own discipline um, and, and expanding that field. There are also um, a, a public engagement and professional learning activities as part of the Board Vision Programme. Um, so this is so the students could extend those conversations beyond their own group. They could work with different audiences, so we've done workshops with children, um, adult workshops, symposiums, um, exhibitions and publications. So that's multidimensional and dynamic um, and, you know, and very much about professional learning for, for graduates. And How are your bottoms doing? Do you need to fidget? Because I'd like to talk about the last project, but never fidget. Okay, the, the last project that I'd like to talk about is um, an ongoing, so yeah, Broad Vision is ongoing, um, and this is a project that started around the same time, so 2009. Um, and it's an engagement with an organism, the slime mold, Physarium polycephalum. Um, it is an intelligent, single celled organism. Um, and it's used as a model organism in loads of areas of research. Lots of people around the world from very different disciplines are asking very different questions of the same single-celled organism. Um, so my collaboration with the organism um, is part of the project, but it's also 
as, as we'll, we'll um, talk through, collaboration with an extended community of scientists, of designers, filmmakers, and public. Um, but it all started with a microbiologist friend of mine giving me a, a little Petri dish with a yellow blob in it and telling me to go home and play with it. Um, so my pet slime mold and me got to know each other. Um, I started working with it empirically. I had no agenda, no funding, there was no, 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 no purpose to this other than observe it and see if it's interesting. So I started to observe and watch it grow. I observed its behaviours. Um, it, it migrates, you'll see it in action in a minute. Um, but it's quite independent-minded. It was fed up with one petri dish, so this is it, it's escaping to find the new territories. One of the early um, observations looked like a, a moment, oh dear, can you see it growing? Um, but where it meets just then, it somehow knows it's already there, it doesn't join up, it then retreats, puts its energy into its back end and goes off in other directions. Um, so what you're looking at is a mass cell made up of Lots of, lots of cells joined together, but they're all operating as one individual cell with many, many nuclei. So that slime mold could have millions of individual nuclei. So it's collective uh, mass supercell. Um, and it has incredible abilities to navigate its environment, uh, to be able to respond to its environment, to work as a collective, to communicate to different parts of the cells. Um, it has emergent Principles, so it has been compared to ant colonies, uh, the way cities work, the way the web works. Um, there's the, the, you have just local agent based uh, behaviours and communications, no overall control system, um, and this idea is a constant feedback loop. Um, so I captured some of these moments of seeming intention, um, and I am very guilty of anthropomorphising this organism, so I'm just going to confess that. Sometimes I do attribute it with more human characteristics than is rightly so. Um, but I'm interested in, you know, it begs questions about our ideas of intelligence and autonomy. Um, and what, you know, whilst I was getting to know it in the studio, um, I read a lot of the research on it, and there, there are some really classic experiments. Um, so if you're interested in single celled organisms and intelligence at a cellular level, um, there are a good couple here to get you going. The, I'm just going to very briefly talk about the research because it, it, it's interesting. Um, so what they asked to do, this is a group in Japan, um, they were interested in its networking ability. Um, so I need to tell you that the white dots are oats, it likes porridge oats to eat, um, and the yellow is the slime mold that's growing between them. So over a period of time, a blob of slime mold is growing and connecting between different oats. So when it grows, it fans out, when it finds food, it forms, it reduces and forms an efficient network between them. So that's that's kind of its, its biological behaviour. Um, so over a period of time it had a little F diagram after 26 hours, it had optimised its efficient network between these oats. Um, the oats represent uh, the big oats in the middle represents Tokyo. Um, and the surrounding oaks are suburban main uh, points of transport intersection. So they compared this to the actual transport system of Tokyo, and the slime mold had pretty much exactly replicated the Tokyo transport system. Um, so they, they concluded that Tokyo had a very efficient transport system, because the slime mold agreed with it. Um, another um, research paper by uh, some of the same group invited the slime mold to um, fill a maze. So it joins together, forms this mass cell. They introduced two oaks at different points in the maze, um, and the maze optimised and joined together between, between the two oaks. They did it time and time again, and each and every time the slime mold sh chose the shortest route. Um, the most efficient and the shortest route. So they concluded that this had this demonstrated a primitive 